Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Peter Miss. I am a recovered alcoholic. And if you thought you were going to see Peter I'm really sorry. <laughs> We come from, he comes from New Jersey, I come from Old Jersey. Old Jersey is a little island uh, just off the coast of France that still belongs to, still belongs to England somehow. We're not quite sure how, but, but the, all the law is in French and it's all kind of very strange and very crazy. But it was once, once described as 70,000 alcoholics clinging to a rock in the middle of the English Channel. <laughs> I was one of those alcoholics clinging to that rock. Uh, I got sober in Jersey on December the 11th, 1981. Uh, I have, with the grace of God and steps in this book, I've got 31 years of sobriety. Uh, I think, uh, without, without sort of pressing it very far, that's pretty much permanent sobriety. Um, though I've got to tell you, and it, you, it, later on you'll see that it very nearly wasn't. Um, I'm going to tell you what happened, what I was like, what happened, what it's like now. Um, my drinking story is going to be very short. I started drinking when I was 14. I was awkward. I was a very strange teen. I'm tall. I got tall really quick. I got tall quicker than I grew that way. Okay, so I was very strange. Uh, I walked strange. They used to call me the India rubber man. Um, because I was kind of like lanky. It's kind of awkward. We all say we didn't fit in. Uh, you'll find out tomorrow if you come to the workshop why I didn't fit in. Um, you know, there's some of us who say we have a spiritual malady. The big book doesn't say that. The big book doesn't say that that's what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me is selfishness, self centeredness. That's why I was awkward. Because everybody, I thought everybody's looking at me. That's why I was awkward. That's why I was shy. Because I thought everybody's looking at me. And they weren't, you know. But that's another story. One night I went out with um, the, the son of the landlord of a pub that my grandfather used to, used to drink in. And um, he was several years older than me. I was 14, he must have been 17. He was driving a car. And he had some older friends as well. And we ended up on a bit of a pub crawl. We ended up, and I discovered very early on, something, something called, called snake bite, which was brandy and cider. So, and the cider we're talking about is not American cider. This is English cider, which is more alcoholic than wine. Okay, so it's about 12%, 12-14% with a shot of brandy in it. Uh, that, and I took a drink of that, and I went, and now I could run with these guys, I could go talk to the girls, I could go and do, do discos. It was, a seven, it was the 60s, early 60s. I could go do discos. I turned from being a very shy, goofy kid into one of the in crowd. I was a mod. But then I had a motorcycle, so I wasn't quite... I was a mocker, which is halfway between a mod and a rocker. <laughs> And a, and a rocker, and they had leather jackets and sideburns and slick back hair and stuff, and I had longer hair, and it got longer and longer and longer, and us mods turned into hippies. Uh, that's what happened in the UK. I don't know what happened here, but this is what happened with us. Uh, I was also a surfer. So I was really, I was into all sorts of stuff. But alcohol was my buddy all the way through my teen years, from the time I was 14 to the time that I kind of left home and for some reason or other went to sea. I was supposed to go to art school, but I ended up going to sea. I think that kind of might have saved my life. There was a lot of stuff going on in art school in the 1960s, including revolution and a whole bunch of drugs, so maybe that saved my life. But if you drank the way that I drank, you needed several things. You need, First of all, you needed money to buy the alcohol. You needed someone to give you food, and you needed somewhere to go to sleep. And if you're on a ship, you get all three. 
Plus, on the ships I was on, which were going foreign, we also had bonded stores. And once you got outside of the 12 mile limit, you could buy whiskey at about a third of the price that you would pay for it ashore. I love that. There was always a bottle, there was always a bottle of spirits and a case of beer in my cabin. Always. I used to drink to go drinking. <laughs> when we got to, when we get someplace, we'd go ashore. The ship would come up alongside. We'd be getting ready to go ashore. I would have a bottle of rum or a bottle of whiskey open, and I'd have several shots of that so I could go ashore and go drink. And I was drinking to go drinking, and there was nothing wrong with my drinking. I believe I was an alcoholic halfway. I was. I believe that I drank alcoholically halfway down my first drink because I got that sense of ease and comfort that came at once. <coughs> talks about it in the big book, it talks about a sense of ease and comfort that comes out once. Nothing else did it. Nothing else. And it's like I'd held my breath until the time I took that drink. And it was a spiritual awakening. It allowed me to do stuff that I couldn't do in cold blood. And it was my buddy for many years. I drank for 20 years. It's not that long, actually. I drank from the time I was 14 to the time I was 34. It got progressively worse. I spent time at sea with the idea of coming back to Jersey and being a sea pilot. Jersey's a very rocky place. We've got lots of rocks. And we've got this tide that disappears like three miles out there somewhere and all these rocks show up and the island at low water is about a third the size, third the size bigger than it is at high water. And there's all these rocks. And one day I was on a ship, and I'd been I'd gone. We, we technical reasons we had to travel with the ship. And the night before I'd been sitting down watching the TV on this French ship with all this wine about, and they'd gone to bed, and I'd carried on drinking, watching this TV, and I took a bottle of bed with me. And the next morning we get to Jersey, and they call the pilot to bring the ship into the harbour. And I got up under the bridge, and I'm three parts wrecked and I looked out the window and it was foggy and I'm drunk and I'm looking in I'm bringing the ship in on the radar and I it didn't look right and I walked to the edge of the, the bridge and I looked down and there's this rock going past about two meters away there's 600 passengers on this boat there's I don't know how many cars we're headed for the rocks I missed it by by the time I got in, someone had phoned ahead or whatever. I was told I should shape up or ship out. What did I decide to do? Ship out, because I couldn't stop drinking. So I changed my job. Progressively worse, I ended up sitting in my car one day with a bottle of vodka under the seat, my surfboard in the back, watching the guys go surfing and knowing that I couldn't do it anymore because I was now frightened of the water and I was too drunk to stand up anyway. Not that I stood up, I was kneeboarder, but that's one of those things. I was on my knees anyway. But and I just knew it. And it took away something that that I loved, that I was really committed to. And it took it away, but it was okay because I could still do it. I'd got married by this time That lasted until about two years after I got sober and we got divorced, which is not uncommon apparently. I made promises to my wife, I made promises to my parents, I made promises to the people I worked with. I ended up um, as a, a place where I could only employ me. And I ended up working for myself and I had a hole in the wall panel beaten business that did cheap lease price. I'm a sea captain. But it was okay because I could keep on drinking. And in my in my in my workshop I was never more than about six feet away from alcohol. I had it hidden everywhere. It was everywhere. It was in my it was in my um, in my toolkit and whatever and I, I spoke to somebody after I got to Alcoholics Anonymous who was in the same situation and I never thought of this. 
But he had vodka in that thing that you put, you top up batteries with. It's got that funny kind of spigot thing on the top, just a bottle with this rubber spigot thing on the top to topping up batteries. And he had vodka in there. They didn't know how to get any deal. I never thought of that. I wasn't as creative as that. I just had bottles everywhere. They were just like stashed away. And I had a buddy called Fred. And my buddy called Fred used to come and see me and he used to bring a case of, Schlo- of uh, Grolsch lager. And we used to sit in the back of my back of my workshop with all these busted up old cars and motorcycles and stuff and we used to drink rocks. And then he used to go away and he used to leave some cans there and he said, oh, we'll finish them next time I come round. And the next time he came round, they'd gone. And he went, where did that go? It was only yesterday. I said, well, they're gone. So I have to get some more. What's really interesting about Fred is that Fred ran with me. He, talk, he, he drank with me. We drank at the same places, we hung out with the same people, we drank the same amount. And one day Fred met a young lady. And she said to him, I don't like you hanging out with that Peter Misson guy. He drinks too much, you come home too, you come home drunk, and if we're going to have this relationship, I don't want you to do that anymore. And he said, that's okay, my love, I'll have two and I'll come home. And what did Fred do? He had two and come home. He could pull it off. I used to say to my wife, I won't be late tonight, I'm just going to go down and I'm just going to have a couple. Maybe Wednesday I'd turn up home. <laughs> I knew I had to leave because my dinner was on the... It was like a promise. And I knew I had to leave. But it was like 7 o'clock in the evening and it was an awful long time from the time I went to bed at 11 o'clock and I needed one more. And I'd have one more. And then it was... Well, you know, it's getting a bit late now anyway so maybe one more wouldn't, wouldn't hurt because the dinner's going to be cold anyway. And then it gets to be 11 o'clock, and I'm still thinking, well, maybe I'll have to take a couple of bottles home. And so I'd have what we call a carry-out. And I'd take some bottles home with me, and I'd come home drunk, and there'd be a scene, and all this kind of stuff. The last five years of my drinking were continuous. I was unemployable. Um, I'd done some other stuff. I'd gone out and tried to save the world as well. That was the other deal. That was awesome. the arrogance of this thing. I was involved in Greenpeace and stuff. I was wrecked all the way through that. I had, by this time, I had beard down here somewhere. I had shoulder length hair. Um, I had all the deal. I was, I was a real hippie. It was, but I was drinking all the time. I was using, I was using other, other stuff. I was smoking a lot of dope and psychedelics, but I seemed to have control and choice over those. What I didn't have any choice and control over was alcohol. It was always there. It was always there somewhere. You know, do a couple of lines of coke, mm, a glass of wine would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And that glass of wine would be really nice usually turned out to be a very large bottle of wine. <laughs> and I used to like that, uh, I can't remember what it was called, Lambrusco. It had a slightly little fizzy kind of thing. I like that, I like that sort of stuff. Love brandy. So like all that stuff. When I got to be 34 and two months or three months, I was uh, got to a place. Well, when I in, in the last two years of my drinking, I'd had three, three suicide attempts. The reason I had three suicide attempts was that I kept on promising the people I loved and that loved me that I wouldn't do it anymore, and I went and did it again. And I really desperately didn't want to do it, but I did it again. And I did it again, and I did it again, and I really meant it when I promised them I wasn't lying. And I got to think that I was, I was some kind of, I was some kind of bad person. That actually, it would, they would all be better off if I wasn't there. And after three suicide attempts, the last one was the most successful. If you see what I mean. I got better at it. I was a practicing alcoholic and a practicing suicide. I never learned how to drink, but I was learning how to kill myself. <laughs> if you see what I mean. The last time it was a big pump out job and I was unconscious for a while and all that kind of stuff and they stuck me next to a guy who was dying of lung cancer. They do that with suicides, you know. They put you next to somebody that's really dying. And I discharged myself and he just carried on drinking. And on the tenth night of the 10th of December, 1981, I'd been drunk for a long time, maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks, but really drunk. I mean, I was drinking all the time, but I was really, I was knee-walking drunk for maybe three weeks. 
And I used to go down to the shop in the morning, you know, it's got nothing to do with alcohol, you see. I used to wake up in the morning and I'd be shaking and feeling awful and I'd go down to the, to, there's a, there was a little, little, there was a little kind of apartment underneath where I lived that I let out to some guy that, and they had an ele- there was an electric meter. And the electric meter paid for the electric bill out of the rent and it was like my money. But I would break into the electric meter and take some money out of the electric meter to go down the shop and buy a bottle of cheap wine. And I'd be shaking and I'd be rattling and I'd be walking down the hill to go and get this bottle of cheap wine. And it was like French wine. It's vowed in air and it's, it's got like a tall bottle with stars around the top. And there's like a little metal cap that you pull off and there's a little plastic cap inside you flick off and that's the last time you see that. Transportation purposes only. You know, this is the drink. This is drinker's boots. And it's rough as hell. It takes the skin off your throat when you, but it hits the spot. And I, I get into the shop and I, I just about get my money out and I put it on the horse and I pick up pick up the bottle and I get out the I get out the shop and I'm starting to walk back up the hill to my house and I got it under my arm and I'm okay. I'm feeling okay. I got my buddy now. I haven't even drink yet. But I'm feeling okay. I've got that sense of ease and comfort because I've got my bottle. And I haven't had a drink yet. See it's got nothing to do with booze. When I got home I had that drink. <laughs> But I, I, I fast forward because there's lots of stuff that happened, but I mean, it's such a, it is a long time ago. And I don't think it's the most important part of what happens to me. It's happened to me. It's my drinking. We all know how to do that. We all know how to drink. That's what we're doing here. We, we, we know what it does when we drink. We're great at stopping drinking. Our problem is that we always start again. My, my drinking was almost continuous for the last, maybe the last five or six years. The only time I ever stopped for any length of time was for about three months, was to get that pilot's exam. To actually get that exam so that I could bring ships in and out of the harbor. And I, I, I failed it the first time because I was drunk. And the second time I said, I'm going to get this. I've done, it's taken me seven years to get here. I'm going to get this. And I stayed sober. And I said, until I get that exam, I'm not going to have any drinks. And I stayed sober for three months on that, and I got the exam, and within five minutes of passing the exam, I had a drink in my hand. And then I continued to drink as I drank daily for the rest of the, rest of the time. And that was maybe another 10, 12 years. About halfway through. That night on the 10th of uh, December, something happened to me that night. I'd been attempting to do some stuff during the day, and in the night I'm still drinking, I'm drinking vodka and wine. And all of a sudden, I, I, can, I can picture it right now, is that I'm sort of kind of standing swaying in the middle of this room, and the floor went black. The only way I can describe it, the floor went black. I ended up on my knees thinking that if I went into that darkness, I wasn't going to come back. And I ended up on my knees and I said, God, please help me. And I meant it. And then I had the idea to call Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I had no contact that I know about with Alcoholics Anonymous any time in my life before this. Alcoholics Anonymous had only been in Jersey for about seven years. I was born eight years after this book was published. It was published just in time, just for me. (laughs) <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous was about seven years old in Jersey when I, when I, when I, in 1981 it had been there before but it had disappeared they kind of got some infighting going on and the whole thing had just gone they'd all gone out and got drunk <laughs> and it had been restarted by a bunch of Glaswegian builders and gangsters that had come to the island to work on the, uh, in the building these guys were hard people and I hated them because I would drunk with them and I hated them. And I called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I couldn't find Alcoholics Anonymous in the phone book. Couldn't spell alcoholic. It's a funny word. <laughs> the H's, the O's, and the C's are all in the wrong place. I don't spell good. It's one of the other things that I found out that I could do when I could drink. I didn't care whether I couldn't spell good. But what I, what I, who I found was a, an outfit called the Samaritans. And the Samaritans is an outfit that you can call when you're suicidal. And they kind of talk you down. And they're wonderful people. And they do this voluntarily, and they're amazing. 
And I talked to them many times, uh, and I found their num- I knew where their number was. And I called them and said, I've got a problem with alcohol, I need to talk to somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they said, where are you? And I told them where they were, they said, stay there. Someone will call you in ten minutes. And they found somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous, and he called me in ten minutes and said, where are you? And I told him where you were, and he said, we'll be around in twenty minutes. I finished all the wine we had, we had in the house before they came. <laughs> By that time, I was passed out. Was, the two people who came were a guy called Noel, who was an Irish gangster from, from London, from a bad gangster family. A bunch of Irish folks, really notorious where he come from. And a woman called Judith, and they are still sober today still sober today. And they picked me up off the floor and they said, stay there. Someone is going to come to see you in the morning. And in the morning the bell went to the front door and I staggered over to the front door and I'm feeling nauseous and I'm feeling sick and I'm shaking like crazy. And standing in front there was a little little Scotsman. I hate the Scotsman at the time. <laughs> with a little shuru. They said, my name's Billy. I'm an alcoholic. I hear you want to stop drinking. Well, I wasn't sure about that. But I knew I wanted help. And he had, a, he had a blue book under his arm. Like that. And a little cheroot in, in, in his hand. And he came in, and he sat me down, and I sat down by the fire, and I was cold, and it was like December, and he sat next to me smoking this little cheroot, and this little cheroot got to me, and I started throwing up. Nothing to do with the alcohol, of course. And he commenced to tell me his story. And he'd drunk in the same place as I'd drunk in. He's had experience on being shipped like I'd had. He drank like me. He started calling himself an alcoholic. And I thought, well, I drink like that. So if you're an alcoholic, I must be an alcoholic. And he said, you know what's wrong with you? He said, you have an allergy to alcohol. And I didn't know anything else. Well, what are you talking about? He said, when you drink, your body wants more, more alcohol. So when you start drinking, he said, you can't stop drinking. I said, that's why. That's why. And then he said, he said, the other thing, he said, the problem is that when you stop, you start to get thirsty. And you, want, you want to start drinking again. I said, oh, that's why I can't stop. And he said, yeah. And he said, we got some steps. And it was amazing, you know. I, I could have been 12 step by somebody else that said, you didn't have to do that. All you have to do is go to meetings. We had the two types of it. And these guys, these guys, these guys, Weijin guys, they were, they, were, they were the hard men, if you like. Didn't really know what they were doing. I thought Billy had been sober for a long time. He'd only been sober about six months when he came to the top step me. He didn't really know what he was doing. But he had the, he had the instruction book, see? And he was following the instructions. And he taught me how to do the 12 steps. It took a long time. Not like we know how to do it now. It took me about 18 months, I guess, to get to get to step 12. Something like that. A year and a half, I stayed sober. Went to a lot of meetings. What happened to me after that is I got, I got into the middle of AA, and Billy gave me this. Not this particular card. This particular card is the second one I've had. The one Billy gave me, I, I, I gave away to one of my buddies. But this is only the second card I've ever had, and it says on here that I am responsible. Billy gave me this after he'd given the card, so I'd done the third step. He said, I am responsible. And it says, where anyone, anywhere, reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA to be there, always be there. For that, I am responsible. Not you. Yeah. And he said, there you go, carry that with you. Remember that. And I remembered that until I was about about ten years sober. I've been involved in intergroup. I've been chair of intergroup. I've been treasurer of meetings. I've been a delegate to conference. I've been an alternate delegate to conference to start with. Do you know what that makes me? That makes me eligible to be a trustee of Alcoholics Anonymous. I did my three. I was offered that some days ago, uh, some months ago, in Europe, and I said, "Nice." 
I don't want to get stuck in the middle of the service structure of the Alcoholics Anonymous. I said I wouldn't be affected there. I would be hamstrung. I want to be where I can be affected. Because I think this is important. About ten years sober, this is the most important thing that I did. This is the most important part of my story. About ten years sober, I started to see that I didn't actually have very much money. I started to see that I had a very small car. I started to see that I didn't really live in a very good place. And that my wife had divorced me several years before, and I didn't have a lady friend at the time. And I became irritable, restless, and discontent at ten years sober. And I had a plan. Margaret will tell me, tell you, I've always got a plan. I, 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 I have a plan. I've always got a plan. And I had this plan. And this plan involved finding a rich woman <laughs> to marry, so I wouldn't have to work anymore, that had some kind of skill that we could probably both benefit from. Um, property was involved in there, and there was all sorts of other stuff. And uh, in order to do this, I did some. I began some research. And the way I did research is not like we do on the online now. It's, it's well, I believe. I don't know. I mean, it seems to me there's a couple of my protégés are doing it, and I'm getting one of them's getting really goofy. But apparently now you can find these lonely hearts online. What I used to do was local newspapers, you know, box numbers in local. It was, and I I started to play out exactly the same way as I did when I was drinking, but here I am 12, 14 years sober, and I am promiscuous. And I am, do, I am doing this deal with these lonely hearts things. I've now changed my job. I'm, I'm teaching sailing now, so I'm involved lots of young folks around. I'm 40 plus. Most of the other sailing instructors are in their 30s. I'm the old guy. Not the oldest, but I'm the old guy. But I'm kind of playing out. And I'm doing all these, all up and down the south coast of the UK, I'm doing these one night stands and I'm flirting and I'm, 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 a, ter I'm a terrible flirt. <laughs> or I was. I stopped doing it now. With the grace of God, this is another thing that I learned. And I ended up half owning a restaurant. My wife was the chef. She was a very talented lady. Her father was very rich and generous. I was, in fact, the third owner. I wasn't a half owner, I was the third owner. He was the second, he was another third, and she was the third. We were married, and I had everything that I set out to get six years before. Everything. We had a big car, we had several cars. I had a big property, it was a very big property in a village in, in the south coast of the UK. Uh, I was owner of a business that would have been very successful if, it would have, if I'd have carried on with it. Um, I'd married money, the whole deal. And I was batshit crazy. And miserable as sin. I was dissatisfied. I was irritable. I was discontent. I was angry. I felt like I, just like everything was closing in. Somewhere or other, I think I knew the way that I got there. One night, I'm serving customers and there's a bottle of Barramundi. I always remember Australian red wine called Barramundi. It's got it had like a kind of really jazzy cover. Good card label. I poured two glasses for the for the clients. I'm walking out the prep room with these two bottles, two 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 glasses, and my head says, "See, look what you've done. You're feeling like shit. You might as well drink." And my arms got longer. And I set them down on the table. And I walked through the prep room. I walked through the kitchen. My wife said to me, where are you going? I said, out. And I, I was propelled into the streets. And I didn't know what had happened. I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming. Page 24 of this book says a certain time. It says, at a certain time, I will be defenseless against the first drink. It took me 16 years to get there. 
I didn't know what had happened. I got to a meeting two to three days later after locking myself up in a room and rocking and saying how I'm married for two days. I'm a good Catholic boy. I hadn't prayed for years. I did all the stuff. You see, early on in my sobriety, I did all the stuff that this book asked me to do. But then I just got too busy. And then I started to want again. And I started to need again. And I started to, the ego started to regrow. You see, something I learned about this by studying this book, every time they say self in here, we can say ego. That's what we say today. When they wrote the book, they called it self. So if I'm, if I'm self-centered, we call it ego-centered, ego-centered now. They, they say it once in the book. Egocentric as they say it nowadays. But it was new then. We say it all the time now. It's very important when we see self. I see self in here. I see ego. So that's my problem. I don't suffer from a spiritual malady. I suffer from an oversized ego that wants more all the time and is never satisfied when it gets it. I got to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm sitting in the back and it's a it's contemporary IA. They're talking about the washing machine and the dog and the car breaking down. And, the, and I'm sitting in the back and I'm shaking and I'm crying. I'm, I'm, I don't know what's going on. And, it, and, and the meetings have changed. Over the years, the meetings have changed. Over those 15 years, the meetings have changed. When I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, we were 12 stepping people. We were reading this big book. I was listening to tapes very, very early on from people who, who, who knew what they were talking about in AI. And I forgot it all. And I drifted away, and I drifted away, and I drifted away, and I drifted into me. And what I wanted and what I needed. I got back to this meeting, I'm sitting in the back of this meeting, I can remember it, I can remember it vividly. I am actually, I'm in bits. No one said a word to me. Nobody said hello, nobody said whatever, I just slunk in, I went in the back of the meeting, and I'm just sitting there going, well, I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd phoned a guy that I'd 12 step maybe 12 years before. I phoned him up and I said, I almost drank tonight. And he said, when was the last time you went to an AA meeting? And I said, I don't know, I can't remember. Maybe six months ago. He said, you better get your ass there right now. And he put the phone down. It took me three days to get there. Sunday night it was, Exeter, UK. Sunday night meeting in Exeter. I went into there and they're all talking about this stuff. The plumbing and the whatever. And right at the end, a guy called Trevor said, who was one of the meetings, said, is there anybody else in the room that got anything that, 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 that wants to share anything? And I stood up and I said, I'm 16 years sober and I'm suicidal. And I don't know what's going on. And I want help. Thanks for sharing. Serenity prayer. I'm walking out the room and somebody came up to me and said, have you ever worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, yes. He said, when? I said, about 15 years ago. And he said, what happened? I said, I felt I, I got sober. And he said, maybe you're trying to live on the experience you had 15 years ago now. Maybe you should try working the steps again. Come to our meeting in Crediton. We have a big book study meeting. And there's like four of them. And I went to credit and I started which I just sat in a, a big book study. I didn't do anything for about six months. I ended up selling my house. I ended up being gifted with something. I had a detaching resume. The reason why I've had two now, and I know why. You see, when I was drinking and when I got I used to get angry, I used to bang my head on walls. Now, who gets, who gets detaching retinas? Boxers get detaching retinas because they've been hit on the head a lot. I'd have two, one each side. The last one was, the last one was three years ago. This one was the right hand one. I had an operation and I had to, I, I, they filled my eye with gas and all this kind of stuff and I had to lay down for about six weeks in a particular position so that the thing would hit. And I went back to Jersey. I was living in the UK and all over the place. I went back to Jersey. I went back to Jersey and I dragged out some tapes that I had. Little cassette tapes. The old fashioned cassette tapes. And I had a little Sony, a little Sony radio cassette player. 
And I found a bu- bunch of Joe and Charlie tapes. And I stuck those in and they talk, started talking about the big book. So I thought, I better find a big book. And I'm lying down with one eye. That eye, right. And I'm reading the big book. And listening to Joe and Charlie. The old Joe and Charlie. And I'd stop the tape when they told me to read something. And I went and read it. And I'd stop the tape when they asked me to do something. And I did it. And they took me through the steps. Joe and Charlie. 16 years sober with one eye. And I had a spiritual experience. I did a fifth step with a guy that I used to surf with. A guy called Cliff. He was my buddy. He got curry every time I go back. He wasn't really sure what I was doing. Not really. I don't believe. But he was willing to hear it anyway. The fifth step, from six and seven, started to make my amends. My amends to my mother and my father, my ex-wife, my mother and my father were lifelong amends. I finished my amends with my mother and father when they died. I was with them. My hero is my dad. I held him in my arms as he died. My amends were over. He died beautifully. He was spiritual experience. He could never understand me. My dad, one time in the Second World War, was in the Navy. And he was in Southampton during an air raid. And what they used to do, because they were macho, sailor, sailor men, was that they used to get a lock in in the pub during, a, during a, uh, an air raid. They'd lock the doors, nobody in, nobody out, and drink. <laughs> and sometime, he, sometime that night, he went to a blackout. And the next morning, he woke up in the street lying in the street and he said if drinking that much ends up me not remembering what the hell I did and end up me lying in the gutter I am not going to do that again do you know what never did it again (laughs) and I used to do that all the time so never do that again I used to do it again and he said I couldn't understand he said I couldn't understand what was going on and I explained to him that I was able to explain to him eventually what was going on But having reworked these steps in 16 years sober, I realized that what I had not been doing, and what I had not been doing is is the last three steps, and particularly step 12, but also 10 and 11. I think the three are very, very, very important. I also had not been doing something, because I heard something a long time ago by a very famous speaker in in, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, he did the first nine steps once, and he lived in 10, 11, and 12. He didn't explain how you live in 10, 11, and 12, but you do the first, and I took that. I said, yeah, I've done the nine, first nine steps, that's terrific, I'm living in 10, 11, and 12. I read them regularly out the 12 and 12, so I must be living them. You see? And we started to use the 12 and 12 on the big book while I was in those 10 years when I was get, headed towards my rich lady. You got, to, you got, to, you still got. To, you, I got news too that contemporary AA in, in, in France and in, in England and in Jersey is alive and well. They're using that little yellow book, that little yellow book, Living Sober, I think it's called, which I don't think we should ever publish. I don't know what the hell that's doing in Alcoholics Anonymous. It should be retitled the things not to do to stay sober. Seriously. The 12 and 12, I've got, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got an observation about 12 and 12. If you look at the, you look at the fourth step in this book, and you look at the fourth step in the 12 and 12, what the hell was Bill doing at 14 years sober? It wasn't this one. You look at the fourth step in the 12 and 12. It's not what's in here. What short memories we have. You see? Real alcoholics. I'm a real alcoholic. I'm different from other people. It tells me this in here. It says the idea that I'm like other people has to be smashed. That means that it cannot be repaired. You break a cup, you can, you can glue it back together. You smash a cup, 
no chance, too many bits, too small. So the idea that I was like other people, which took me to a place where I almost drank at 16 years sober, because I thought I was like other people now, because I wasn't drinking, was I? Suddenly dawned on me after reworking the steps again that no, no, I'm different. I have to have a way of life that is different from other people, otherwise I am going to go back and drink again. A certain time will show up in my life. Again. And I don't ever want to be in that place where I am so far away from my last drink, yet I am suicidal, yet I am out of my head, yet I am playing out, yet I am doing all the stuff and living in self. It's horrible. It's bad, and I know I can't drink because I'm an alcoholic. But what else was I doing? I was doing some other stuff. I was getting that sense of ease and comfort by being promiscuous, by being a flirt. That is an amazing thing. It's a power thing. It's an amazing thing. And, and I used to get off on all that sort of stuff. I was a bad person. I was <laughs> really bad. My amends to my mum is done. My amends to my first wife is done. My amends to my second wife is done. I've done all my amends. What was really interesting when I revisited the steps was I found out that I hadn't finished my amends. Guess where the amends were that I hadn't finished? Around relationship. Where was I playing out? Around relationship. That was interesting. I, I, I'm one of these frugal drunks. I didn't own a lot of money. But I did own some money to the government. And I paid all that off. What I try and do today is I try and live by what this book says. Somebody once said, you know, that the circle and triangle thing. But I used to be out, you maybe can't see it, but I don't have a really very big one, but I used to be out here living in the world and visiting. I uh, just go to my A and Eden, go back out to the world. Go to my A and Eden, go back out to the world. Since I've reworked the steps, I've realized that I've got to be living in here and I've got to go visit the world. But I've got to come back and live in here. So I'm different. I'm different. The reason why I, I think I think it's to do with this ego thing. If my ego rebuilds on anything, my ego attaches itself to anything. And will take me to that certain place unless I'm spiritually fit. And the answer is I believe in here. Nowhere else. I try all the other stuff. I believe it's in here. Which is the reason why I'm an enthusiast about this book. Uh, I'm not a big book pumper. I'm an enthusiast. There's some folks out there who call me nasty names. I've cleared rooms of alcoholics and They've all walked out. Now that's a very strange thing. Because we're all supposed to be buddies in here. We're all supposed to love you till you can love yourself. They actually said that in that meeting. And when I started to share about the big book, they all walked out. <laughs> Demonstration of love, folks. I have a great privilege to be here and I, I've got to say, I've got to say thank you to the folks that have invited us. I haven't done that yet. I really need to. This is a great privilege. You know, we get a lot of American folks coming over to Europe and telling, you, telling us how they do it here. Well, we're coming from Europe and we're going to tell you tomorrow how we do it over there with this book that comes from America. <laughs> and we're doing, we're, doing, we're, doing, we're doing what we call in England carrying coals to Newcastle <laughs> and we're probably, we're probably preaching to the converted here however however when I study this book and we really read the black parts in this book and if I can take my ego away from what I see in this book, because I don't really read, you know. I, I, I sort of interpret. And when you talk to me, I kind of translate. And I don't actually hear what you say exactly the way you say it. I hear it the way I hear it. Because I'm the one that's hearing it. And when I read, 
I read the black pieces, but I also read the little white stuff in between, and I've learned to read the black part and not the white crap behind. And I started to study this book very closely, and there was stuff in here that they'd rewritten since I read it before. <laughs> and over the last 16 years, I've been reading this book on a regular basis, and they keep on rewriting it. I keep on seeing other pieces. Now, I love The Lord of the Rings, okay? Uh, not the movie, but the book. And I used to carry the book around with me. I was a good hippie. All I said is, we all carried this book. Uh, and it's like quite a big book. <laughs> and I used to carry this around with me, plus about three, three tonne of records. I mean, that was everywhere I went, there was a fan. <laughs> and I think I've read, I think I've read The Lord of the Rings, the whole thing, from cover to cover, about three times. Okay? I don't know how many times I've read this from cover to cover, and I never tire of it. Why? Because I believe this is talking to this, not this. If I can listen with this, if I can read with this, my heart, and not my head, because that gets me into trouble. That gets me into places where I'm searching for rich women that can keep me for the rest of my life. So I don't have to do nothing, and I can just have uh, great stuff. And that takes me, takes me to a very bad place where I almost drinking it. I didn't keep me sober that night. Something else kept me sober. A power greater than me kept me sober. I wasn't spiritually fit. It says in here that we will be safe and protected if we are spiritually fit. I was not spiritually fit that night. But I was kept sober. I was taken to a place where somebody said to me, and it was only in that, and, he, and we didn't really do anything, but he said to me, have you worked to rework the steps? Or maybe you should rework the steps. I got home to Joseph with one eye, and I found my old tapes of Joe and Charlie. They were in a shoebox somewhere hidden. I happened to find a little cassette player. I was able to listen. I had a big book. I was able to listen. I have, been, I have been taken to an amazing things and places. My grand sponsor now was sponsored by Joe McQueen. Now how about that? I didn't know that. When, when, I, when I approached my sponsor, when I met him in the UK and I approached my sponsor, I didn't know that his sponsor had been sponsored by Joe McQueen, who 12-stepped me from the grave, almost, not quite, but almost, on a tape that had been recorded maybe 15, 20 years before. And they were pointing me to this book. It wasn't what they said. It was what was in here that told me what to do that got me to a place where I had a new spiritual experience. What we're going to do very quickly before Jeff pulls the plug on me very quickly, what we're going to do tomorrow is we are going to attempt, right? It's going to be an attempt to go through all 12 steps. We're not going to read them exactly as they were. We're going to pick the bits out. But we're going to tell you our experience of working these steps. We're very small where we are. We don't have, we don't have big meetings where we are. We, we've probably been running for about, in my little place, we've probably been running for about nine years now. And, and on any night when we have a big book study, there's eight of us. However, we started to count the number of people that have come through our meeting and gone away someplace else because we've got people coming and going. And there's many more than that. And, and the influence of our little group is very wide. I've got the great honor of doing a big book study on Skype. And some nights on Skype, we, we circle the earth pretty much. Amazing thing. We got people up in we got people up in from Alaska to via South Africa to Australia. We've got north and south. We've got folks up in, in Norway, we've got folks up in Sweden, we've got people in the UK. It's an amazing thing. And the book says, I'll finish on this, the book says that right in the last chapter it says th th two, threes and fives of us are springing up. And I think that's what's happening with this that there's two, threes, and fives of us enthusiasts for the big book because we know this works. 
we know that if we follow these directions something happens to us that makes us immune to alcohol as long as we continue to stay on the path the path seems to get narrower as we, the more we do and it dawned on me the other day it's like climbing up a mountain when you get to the, the bottom of the mountain the road is very wide up the valley and you're going up towards the mountain and the road, as you go up the mountain the road gets narrower and narrower and narrower and the further up the mountain you go the track gets really narrow but you know what? the view gets better huh? the view gets better out of the valley you can't see much but when you're up on the mountain you can see an awful lot and I love what this book produces in me but more so I love what it produces in other people you know that one of the most amazing things is to see the lights come on with someone that you've just shown how to do this and they've got in touch with their power it's nothing to do with me it's got in touch with their power and their power is switched on the lights there's nothing like that that's the greatest thing in the world you know? and, for the, and, and I still carry this you see. I am responsible but when, they, when, when it says the hand of AA Alcoholics Anonymous is named after this book this book was published six months before there was a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that we know of was in Cleveland they said we're leaving the Oxford group we're Catholics, we can't be members of the Oxford group Protestant organisation, what should we call ourselves? we'll name ourselves after the book okay. the hand of this book I couldn't necessarily admit it just one thing I've got to say this because I heard it again tonight our first tradition in the short form which was an edit by an editor of Grapevine magazine to stick it on a window blind okay, to match the 12 steps so that we could have two window blinds in our meeting, one with the 12 steps on and one with the 12 traditions it's an edit, listen to what it says step one, uh, tradition one our common welfare comes first personal recovery depends upon a, a unity personal recovery so my recovery depends on all you folks sticking together ah does it say that in this book my recovery depends on my relationship with my higher power that's what my recovery depends upon not on the unity of Alcoholics Anonymous I love the idea of unity of Alcoholics Anonymous but what's it say in the long form in the long form it says each member of Alcoholics Anonymous is but a small part of a great whole AA must continue to live or most of us will surely die I think they're talking about the book I think they're talking about the book living how does the book live? we work what is in the book when traditions were written they were assuming that everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous was working out of this book hence our common welfare comes first the common welfare of each of the groups that's why when you come to my group if you don't do what we do we say maybe you need to go to a different group because everybody that comes to our group we work the steps as they are in this book and we would expect you to work the steps as you've come to our group we want you to work the steps the same as we do because if we start to get outnumbered by the people who are not working the steps in our group our group starts to get watered down and we start to end up being a discussion group and we don't want to be the discussion group we've had discussion groups we're fed up with them they don't work we want to do this so we ask you we don't ask you to leave we just suggest you might want to either do what we do or find another group people don't like that but it says <laughs> but it says but it says but individual welfare follows it close afterwards so we will help you find another group <laughs> Should I put the cat among the pigeons when the recording comes out? Right. I, I've got to shut up because otherwise I will I really hope I really hope we can we can have fun tomorrow with this. Um, 
it's it's really it's, we are funny people. Okay, we are funny. So uh, <laughs> we really are. I mean, funny peculiar and funny funny. You know? But funny peculiar. I'm funny peculiar. Um, <laughs> but I hope we can have fun with this tomorrow and that we can zoom through but any kind of schedule that you've seen or whatever you, I guarantee you we won't stick to it <laughs> how, 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 long, how long have we got to break? Uh, yeah. we've got one like now we've probably got about 10 minutes and 15 seconds or something <laughs> ok thank you thank you Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.